Think on Tampa. Welcome to our online interview this afternoon. Today we have Neil Gobioff from the Gobioff Foundation. We interviewed him once before, but we had technical difficulties and a lot's changed in the last two or three weeks. So we figured we'd have him back to talk to us about what's happening in the arts community. Neil, uh, can you tell us about yourself and about your, uh, your brother and about the foundation, please? Sure. So Neil Gobioff, I'm president of the Gobioff Foundation. Uh, foundation was started in 2007 by my brother Howard Gobioff. Uh, he was an early employee of Google and he used some of the funds from the Google, from, from that he made at Google to start the foundation uh, in late 2007 and he passed away in early 2008. Um, foundation fell to myself um, and my wife. Uh, we are the only members of the foundation. Um, and so first thing we did is we looked at who, what he gave to as an individual um, and that fell into two areas, and those were the arts and human rights and civil liberties. And so that's where we direct our giving. Great, thank you very much. Um, uh, could you tell us um, tell us a little bit about your personal background too? What was the art area that you were interested in and what you worked on? So sure. So I um, I've been involved in the Tampa theater community, specifically with job site theater as. Uh, as both as a writer, as a stage manager, as a soundboard operator um, since job site's first season. Um, and uh, so that's kind of where my connection to the arts was. Uh, my wife's family, her brothers uh, are artists. And so we were uh, very connected into the arts and the arts here in Tampa were, were very dear and special to us. Um, Outside of that, though, I was uh, my background actually was professionally was uh, was actually I was a software developer. Oh wow! I didn't even know that. <laughs> um, yeah, I learn something new about you all the time. <laughs> um, and the one thing I like about Neil, I mean, a lot of things I like about Neil, but he and his wife take a long term view of the arts, and they look at how to build up the arts community systemically. And could you tell us, you know, what was your Im impression of the arts community in Tampa and Tampa Bay uh, pre-COVID-19? And then afterwards, we'll talk about the rest of it. What do you think was happening at the time? What were the good things that were happening? What were the opportunities? And, uh, you know, what direction were we going in? So the Tampa, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of separate two things here. There's the Tampa Bay community and there's the Tampa community. Uh, the Tampa Bay community is a vibrant, um, it's somewhat, I think, in my opinion, a little bit fractured uh, with the uh, community. The St. Pete side is incredibly uh, robust and uh, supported. Uh, there's a lot of philanthropic support as well as uh, governmental and institutional support for a lot of the arts over in St. Pete. Uh, Tampa has struggled a little bit more with that. Um, the primary difference, I think, between the two sides is also in the visibility. Uh, the visibility in St. Pete is everyone knows where the arts are. The arts are huge. They're everywhere you go. You can't miss the art. Um, the, my impression, though, for the longest time in Tampa has been that a lot of the people who aren't parts of the community, the people outside of the arts community, uh, really feel like the arts begin and end downtown in Tampa. Um, they see the Strauss, they see um, the Tampa Museum of Art, this Tampa Theater, um, and that's kind of their vision of where the arts are in Tampa, and that's it. But there's so much more going on. Um, you know, Seminole Heights has an incredible uh, scene of, of small galleries. Uh, there's Tempest Project, there's Quaid, there's the garage galleries of Coco Hyundai and Parallelogram. And um, all this is helping and creating an incredibly robust community. Um, but there's also other areas of arts, the arts here in Tampa that aren't as visible. Um, there's plenty of artists that operate, still operate, or still operate, I should say, out of Ebor, um, which for a long time was a great art scene when I first moved here to Tampa 25 years ago. And then it kind of became a little more commercial before it's starting to, I think, get back to being an art scene. Great, and um, uh, so much that we could talk about with you. <laughs> and yeah, thanks for thanks for bringing it up and for all your leadership. Just for anybody who's um, who's logging in, this is uh, Neil Gobioff from the Gobioff Foundation. Um, he and his wife support the arts through, uh, and um, 
his, they've been strategic leaders in the arts. And for any of the regular Catholic on Tampa folks, um, Catholic on Tampa partnered with the Govia Foundation on the uh, mayoral forum um, a year ago, which was the highest attended of all the mayoral forums, which shows there's a huge interest in the arts. And then uh, Catholic on Tampa also partnered with Govia Foundation on um, the mayor's form of the arts, where uh, Mayor Jane Castor uh, got to listen to the community and uh, give feedback on and what's um, going on in the arts. And uh, Robin and I at least was here a minute ago and said hi. Um, and there are a bunch of other people logging in. If anybody has any questions, post underneath the video feed or to the right. Um, so Neil, tell us tell us from an infrastructure point of view or, or um, grassroots point of view, what do you think, again, pre-COVID-19, what was needed in the arts community in Tampa? What, what could we all do to support and help the arts community in Tampa grow? There's, I think there's a lot of things that were, were needed. Um, I mean, primarily, I think what it needed, people they needed support. Um, they needed the support of people to attend, to go see things, to buy art from local artists. Um, you know, but I think there's all sorts of infrastructure things that were missing. You know, we Tampa it's verse, needs studio spaces. It needs live work spaces. Um, you know, St. Pete has the warehouse um, creative exchange, which has some studios, but they have a you know multi-year long waiting list. Um, and so I think the whole region could benefit from more studio spaces um, as well as uh, live work spaces that for, for artists to operate out of. And there's always, I mean, we need more, more exhibitions, um, more galleries, more places for people to exhibit their, that, that show local artists for the, so the they have somewhere to display their work. And that's specifically visual arts. I mean, the theater, theaters um, have been thriving to an extent. I mean, it's always a struggle getting people in the door, I think, that you know, some shows do better than others and that's a matter of taste uh, um, and what you like, but there's uh, always, there's been this, there's one year I remember uh, not too long ago, there was like eight new theater companies. So now they didn't all last, um, but some of them did. So um, there are, you know, there's quite a few theater companies that's creating a, a robust theater community. Um, but yeah, yeah, I mean, there's just always space for more. And in the mayor's form on the arts and afterwards, uh, you and Gianna did a study of the, the people that participated, but also artists in the community. And can you tell us what you remember of the top line of, of those oh, results? I forgot you were gonna ask about that. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, so th there's a caveat to this. Um, so we, we actually got a pretty good response to a survey. Um, we had over, think, over 100 respondents. Um, but the one thing to think that, that we noticed is the demographic data of the respondents. There was, it was a very narrow demographic that actually took the time to respond. Um, it was predominantly, uh, I think it was over 50 uh, white women who responded to the survey. And so with that caveat in mind, uh, I, I do believe that there was the, some of the things that were highlighted to me was the need for more support, um, pr both from government and business in Tampa um, was one of the big things that stuck out for me. Um, I think, you know, what ha especially at the grassroots level, when, you know, I when I was involved with the theaters and with people, we we are always struggled. I were you? I was on the board for job site for a little bit too, and I remember the conversations about how do we get those marketing dollars in from some of these larger institutions? What's the trick to get them to sponsor you? To to be able to pay for to to bring in the, to to sponsor a performance or a season, and, and it, it's a hard nut to crack and to get those that thing and. Meanwhile, there's um, Americans for the Arts has an incredible uh, infographic about the 10 reasons or eight reasons that businesses should sp support the arts and what the ways that they can support the arts. Um, there's an incredible value to them, but uh, a lot of times the larger corporations, all they see is the numbers and it's, um, it's, it's marketing. How many, how many people are going to be there or what access can they get um, to do the sponsorship? Um, they're, they're not, the bigger picture though is also in what it's doing to the community and not just for them, so. 
Um, I wish they saw it more as a less of an ROI and more of a what what they can do to help. Well, you talked about diversity a minute ago, and I should say, uh, Neil and I uh, put together the the um, the speakers for for the mayor's forum in the arts. We had like fifteen or eighteen speakers. And, and knowing that the mayor was going to be involved, we tried in every way to have every kind of diversity from, uh, you know, gender to age to um, ethnicity, religion, um, and different kinds of arts. And when you cross-reference all of that, um, you have really have to work hard. And still, one of the criticisms we got is that we weren't as diverse as we should have been. And so I think it sensitized us both to really... Uh, you know, digging deep in the community and whatever we do going forward, we're in particular very uh, sensitive. Any, any, sorry, I talked, but any other comments or thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I think um, the equity and diversity are incredibly important to us as a foundation as well. Um, and it's one of the things that it, it's always a struggle to, you always can do better. Um, but every step is a step in the right direction. When, when you have something like that, there's a limit to how many people you can bring on stage and when you so we have to be thoughtful in who we can pick um and also we were tapping into our networks and our networks are uh, acknowledged they're limited um but they're currently they're, they're continually expanding as we reach into new new connect with new people um it's something that John and I struggle with with um, our Treasure Tampa grant and, and making sure we are reaching diverse communities to know that they are eligible to apply and we're encouraged to apply so that we can get a broader impact, a, a broader range of people. Yeah, there's a, a first question. And if anybody has any questions, please post them if you're looking at your phone underneath the video feed or if you're looking on your computer to the right. First question is about um, how can we best sell the intangible rewards that the arts community bring to a community? If I knew that, I'd be doing it. Um, you know, I, I, like I said, Americans for the Arts has, I, I, let me see if I can bring it up real quick. The, uh, I forget what the exact name of their Thing was, um, it's like gotta, partners or something. Well, you're looking that up. Number one, uh, Neil and Gianna through the foundation have supported um, a, um, um, and I think through uh, the Business Committee of the Arts has uh, supported um, a, an impact study, economic impact study uh, for the arts, and that makes a lot, has a lot of details. And then the other thing is that uh, for the Mayor's Forum of the Arts. We put together a panel on the economic impact of the arts, and so there, there's a, actually a real tangible impact um, be, besides the intangibles. Um, but go ahead. So they um, they have the they call it the partnership movement, um, which A R T and partnership being capitalized. Um, um, and so they actually have a website, partnershipmovement.org, which has you know like I said the eight reasons why to partner with the arts. Um, you know, the first one is cultivate diversity and empathy, amplify skills. These are some of the things that you talk about all the time, Bill, is amplify skills, drive innovation, um, enliven the workplace, uh, advance civic and social priorities and enrich community life, um, show gratitude. So there's all sorts of ways and there's a, it's a great, it's a great resource on the, their website to about ways to do that. But one of the great ways. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, one of the great ways we have to promote the arts now is that what have people been doing for the last two months sitting at home? Very much you can go outside. So most of the people are enjoying the arts at home. Your mic's getting messed up a little bit there. No, I can't hear you. <laughs> oh, there you go. Okay, I, guess I had to turn volume up. You got really soft. Okay. Um, there we go. Now it's loud again. <laughs> yeah, so what, what I was saying is people in the last six weeks, people have been enjoying the arts in all different forms. If you're reading a book, listening to music, watching a movie, watching TV, playing video game, all that is the arts. Yeah, and you know, it's interesting to watch uh, how all the different nonprofit organizations are pivoting to offer uh, content online, whether it's uh, exhibitions that are they they highlight into a curator tour, or there's a perform people performers, um, or connecting and new ways of connecting with their audience. Um, 
one of the conversations that John and I have had, and one of our concerns is um, how can they monetize some of this to where they're losing all their admission sales um, and their funds from admissions. Um, how can they avoid artists giving away their content? Um, how can they monetize it so that artists can still be paid for their work? How can the organizations get paid for admissions? Um, it, it's, it concerns us a little bit that there's set a precedence being set for an expectation that, well, I got it for free when we're at home. Why, why can't I get it for free now? You're muted. Yeah, I mean, no, um, and then coming back, uh, coming back to live performances, I don't know when we're going to be allowed to do that, but um, if we're six feet apart or 25% capacity, I don't know how the theater groups are going to survive that. Well, I don't think theaters are going to open up right away. I think the museums now are allowed to open up at a lower capacity as of today in Florida. Um, but uh, yeah, theaters, it's, it's not just the struggle of the capacity. And yeah, I mean, they budgeted everything that, you know, the 100% the sold out, you know, or whatever, that's the best scenario. But when they budget, obviously they budget for certain percentage filled, but it's not as low as 25%. And so then you also have to struggle with how people are gonna feel about coming in and sitting that close to people. It's a, it's a different world that they're coming back to. Um, yeah, well, the arts- It's gonna take some time. What the arts used to provide, which is of great value, is a is a common social experience. And now we're telling everybody to not have them. Um, so it'll be interesting, at least not in person. Um, yeah. What? Uh, so you've also been doing some roundtables. Uh, by the way, if anybody has any questions, post underneath or to the right of the video, and we will ask it. Um, uh, you also have been uh, surveying and, and holding roundtable discussions with artists over the past month or so. Can you tell us what the results of that have been? What feedback have you well, got? Well, we, we actually, we, we helped uh, held a session with nonprofit organizations, some of our grantees, and we invited some others to join us. Um, and it was, it, was, it was kind of a way for them to share their stories and tell what was, how they were impacted and what they were doing to adjust. And since that was about a month ago, and we, we, sh we, we were talking this morning about we should schedule another one soon. Um, and so we'll probably reach out to them this week to try and do another one. One, you know, was, there was a difference in some of the way the organizations approach things. There was definitely like the large organizations that they were a little more able to weather a longer period, but at the same with what they had and paying employees, but there was definitely a concern for having to pay the facilities, having to pay the employee, being able to pay employees, not having to lay people off um, versus the smaller was definitely more concerned about the artists and how they were paying the artists and the fact that they couldn't hire artists now because they didn't have something to hire them for. Um, it was, it's just a different way of, of how they were impacted directly. I think they're all very concerned about all the people who are being impacted that they are responsible for in some way or, or are helping keep uh, paid and, and, and giving them jobs. Um, you know, we, we, then we held, after that, we held the two webinars about the CARES Act, one specifically with, with Shoemaker and Luke and Kendrick host are presenting, one specifically aimed at nonprofits and one aimed at artists. Um, and the questions were, it was concerning. And, you know, most of that's already been out there in the news about, you know, a lot of them were having trouble even getting a bank to be willing to give them a, apply for the CARES Act or for the, for the loans to the CARES Act because they needed to have an established account and then they had to have the right kind of account. And so um, and was a, back when we had that, there was still a lot of confusion. Um, and then to find out a lot of it went to larger organizations was pretty disheartening. Um, and, and part of this goes back to uh, capacity building in the arts community. And um, through my uh, day job, Tucker Hall, and with the Gobiel Foundation, we sponsored um, a, a round table at um, the Tampa Museum of Art to bring together a hundred and something artists to talk about what they needed, what they were interested in. Um, and 
and you know, part of what you're talking about is the is the business of the arts. Can you can you tell us you know what feedback you heard there and what other what other capacity building things you think the arts community grassroots arts community needs? Uh, yeah, I think one of the things uh, it goes back to space is one of it and places to to, to show their work whether it's performing space or or visual arts or um, they all need somewhere to show the art um, without somewhere to show it and somewhere they can charge admission or sell their work. It, it, it doesn't matter, you know, they, they can produce all they want, but if no one, they don't have somewhere to, to sell it to someone, then it, they're not, they can't make a living doing it. Um, I think the first, that that was a great opportunity. And I know there was another one scheduled that unfortunately got postponed because of, because of COVID-19, but the, um, one of the greatest things about that was I think all these artists got together in a room, which hadn't happened in Tampa in a long time and started conversations. Um, I think that's something that needs to happen regularly. Um, and because there were different artists from different communities, um, like there were some of the, some of the Ebor artists and people from Summer Heights and people from over here. And even some, I think from Pinellas that came over that were now talking that hadn't, that didn't know each other existed basically. And I think that's a incredibly valuable because like I was saying, I think there's a, a little bit of a fractured feeling in the community and uh, the more communication that can happen, the, the better they can all, everyone can help each other. And one of the problems that we had is, is uh, trying to find a list of uh, grassroots artists, right? I think the city has a list, maybe Tampa Museum of Art has a list. There are different organizations that have lists and luckily, with several of these events that we've talked about, um, we were all able to partner. And now there's several uh, Facebook pages. Um, there's like Artists Tampa Bay, there's United Artists of Tampa Bay. And uh, you know, all these Facebook pages are, are critical to try to um, connect with the community. And um, how many, you know, what percentage of the community do you think we know about right now? Are there, are, if our list had 500 people on them, you think there are 2000 that we that we don't know about or what? what's the scale? Yeah, I yeah, I think it depends on how you define artists. I mean, there's there's just so many areas of art. Um, and as far as professional artists or, or people who are working to make funds as artists, I think, yeah, we're probably, there's probably, I don't know, I'm to throw out a number there, but I, I think that's a, we've got a significant chunk of that um, because they're, they're, they're actively working to make funds and make a living with their art. And so they're seeking out opportunities and they're seeking out, those connections. I think there's a huge number of artists, though, that do it on the side, where it's a side gig, they might sell something here or there, or that aren't, we're not connected to. And I think there's plenty of neighborhood art people who work and do things inside their neighborhood with, with their community that aren't represented there. Um, you know, one of the things that I remember hearing, so when Jamie Bennett from Amer um, Arts Place America, who spoke at our uh, the launch for Treasure Tampa, he used to say that, you know, one of the resources that every single community has is artists. Um, you know, the, the, they may be the people who, who, who braid hair, the people who are singing in the choir. Um, there's just, there are artists everywhere. It's just how broad of a definition is really, you know, but all of those people matter and we need to communicate and they all need to connect and collaborate. Somebody asked the question, this is a follow-up, should there be a central register cleaning, clearing house uh, for artists and who should own that? Um, you know, where should that list be? I don't know. I think, I think we've had this conversation a few times and it would be great to have a, a support organization uh, in Tampa. Um, I, you know, would they have the St. Pete Arts Alliance over in St. Pete? Um, and we have Hillsborough Arts Council, which has a, has a list. I think the Arts Council's list is uh, in need of some updating. Um, the city of Tampa, I'm sure has a list of people they connect with, uh, as far as the central, it's, uh, that I think the artists, that's up to the artists. It'd be great if the artists would, if the, I don't know, there's plenty of artists, I think who wouldn't want to be on a central registered list. So let's put it that way. Okay. So also I should say, since Robin Nye is watching, she's the public arts person for the city. And I sit on, for his closure, I sit on her committee public arts committee, but she's had a lot of great ideas for a long time. And um, now she's got a mayor who, and, and the mayor's partner who are both really interested in the arts and collectors of the arts and patrons of the arts. And um, the, uh, the great thing around the city was, was that everybody was talking about how uh, the mayor went through and picked out all the best art 
to put in her office. And that was a great thing because it showed that the mayor was really interested in the arts and that the, and that the city's art collection is, is important and valuable. And the mayor also took a tour with Robin of, of all the public arts projects in the community. And there are a lot of really exciting, I won't leak them, but there are a lot of really exciting projects on the horizon that Robin will be announcing over the next few months. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited for this year's Lights on Tampa. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about the economic impact of the arts in, in the last couple of minutes that we're here. So, uh, you know, we talk about how in the in the future, um, uh, uh, software robots are quickly taking over process oriented white collar jobs. And, and, you know, our kids and their kids are going to need to be creative and disruptive if we're going to have jobs that are above and better than the AI, the artificial intelligence. Um, and so I think we both think that the arts are really important to that. Um, but we also heard at the, the Mayor's Forum of the Arts that, um, you know, several big companies have sold in the last couple of years, made uh, billions of dollars for their owners. And one of them uh, was represented on that panel. And he said, it's not just that people are best and brightest people want to live in, the, in a place that has art. It's that their uh, passion is the arts. They work in their minds. They work part time for our company. But when they're out of work, out of our office, their passion is it being deeply involved and engaged in the arts. And so we know that it's an economic engine. That company since sold for a bunch of money, made the people around a bunch of money. And uh, it shows the value that, the, you know, the real economic value that the arts brings. Any other thoughts or comments on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the arts for a company, they want the creative thinking. They want the ways that artists can think uh, outside. Oh, I hate to use this phrase because it's, it's kind of um, cliche, but the outside of the box thinking, the way they, they, they think about and problem solve in unique ways and they think of solutions that others might not because they're always looking for new ways to, to do things. And I think um, I think we need to have that in government more too. And it, you know, you see that in some places where they have an artist in residence whose job, whether us both at companies as well as in government, where they, they their job is to kind of work with all the departments to kind of come up with new ways and connect those pieces. So where there may be one department, uh, you know, the, the, who's doing repairs on the roads and it has to communicate something to a certain, to a group of people in a certain way, they, they'll commute, they'll work with the artist in ways that they can communicate better um, or ways that they need to gather information from the community better. Um, and so the, and there's plenty of places around the country where this is done and this is done very successfully. Um, so I think that's part of it. I think in that there's there's actually companies out there too. If you Google or do a search for for artists in residence um, companies, there you'll find companies that actually have artists in residence, where the artists will spend three six months on, in, in the company, um, both working with departments like that on actual projects, but also creating just like a regular residency. So we talked about the impact on companies and creativity and hiring and, uh, and maintain, retaining the best and brightest. Uh, the other thing is we know that um, the, the institutional arts groups are major economic engines. So the Dali Museum pumps lots of money into the economy as people are flying in from all over the world to see it. Um, other museums and activities do that. We know the Strad Center uh, around big shows like Hamilton, all the restaurants for several hours before are full. Afterwards, all the bars are full. Um, but there's also the business of the arts and uh, tell a quick story. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was at in St. Augustine and I saw some watercolor <laughs> paintings on the wall and they were like thirty to fifty thousand dollars. And I said, "Wow, these should be in a museum." Uh, you know, why aren't they? And the lady said, "Well, this artist has uh, uh, art in museums, like twenty six around the world, and he also was a runner up for um, the uh, I think it was the, the President Obama or Michelle Obama uh, portrait." And I said, "Well, where is this artist from?" And she said, "Tampa." And it turns out his studio is in um, uh, in uh, in Channel Side, and he lives on Harbor Island. Um, and uh, he happens to be, you know, one of the most prominent African American artists in the United States. And and so he paints these paintings, sells them for thirty to fifty thousand dollars. All of it, that's bringing real money into our economy. It's a real business. Yeah, and I think what surprises me most about that story is, is that he's people don't know about him here in, in Tampa, right? He's known all over the world, but not in, not in the place where he lives. And, and I think that speaks more to the history of, of Tampa's view on the arts than anything else. And that's, that's the, the, a little bit of the uphill battle that we were talking about earlier about the visibility of the arts and the visibility of the resources 
and the talent and everything that is actually here now, instead of looking at where the art, you know, so I used to, I say this all the time to people. It's like the, the, the impression for the longest time, the impression of the arts in Tampa has always been, it doesn't, it's not good unless it comes from somewhere else. And, and that's a battle. Like, you know, there's galleries that were that closed because they couldn't sell to collectors here because all the collectors wanted them to go with them to New York to buy stuff there. So, you know, how do you, how do you fight against that? I think, I think we're, we're at a tilt tipping point now we have, uh, and, and one of the big things is, is an administration that, that supports the arts. Even, you know, this came out at the, um, the mayoral forum. One of the first things a mayor can do and the easiest and cheapest things they can do to support the arts is to show up, to go to the arts event. Um, and that's, that's the first step. And, and I, I, I've seen that from our current administration. And so I think, I think that's a positive sign that we'll, uh, we're going to turn a corner with the, with the arts in Tampa in the, in the near future. Well, thanks so much for your time. We're at our, at the end now, um, but uh, thanks for all that uh, that you and Gianna do to support the arts and, and help the arts in, in our uh, broad community grow. Any final thoughts? I just want to make sure everyone knows about the, the HARP, uh, Hillsboro Artist uh, Relief Program that we help fund that's operated by Tampa Bay Businesses and the community. Businesses in, for Culture and the Arts. It's at tbbca.org. Um, it's $500 grants for artists uh, who have been impacted by uh, COVID-19 for helping them support their needs. These are grants, not loans. Uh, there is a similar program in Pinellas run by Pinellas Community Foundation. So please take advantage of those. We help support that as well. Um, but there's uh, that one, I don't, I, I don't know if they're still taking applications, but there are still funds available for the HARP. Here in, here in Hillsborough. And if anybody is interested in the arts or you know somebody who's interested in the arts and wants to be involved in leadership in the arts, please let us know. Um, uh, the organization that he just mentioned is run by a lady named Susanna Weymouth. And I happen to be at one of her events. She introduced me to Neil. And you know the contacts, connections, the collaboration, it, you know, really are gonna make this happen. So thanks so much, Neil, for coming Thank on you. and all you do for the community. Thank you.